Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I acknowledge that I am presenting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands on which you all join us today. I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and acknowledge their continuing connections to land, waters and community. Uh, just some quick housekeeping. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and uh, we will make it available for viewing uh, a bit later. And if you have any questions, please send them through as we keep chatting and um, in the chat box and we will answer them as they come. So um, just a quick little introduction. Uh, my name is Yelena. I'm the Environmental Heritage Advocate at National Trust Victoria. Um, I advocate for the protection of uh, significant trees and landscapes. Um, and Joanna is here with me. Joanna, do you want to just quickly say who you are? Sure. So I work with the National Trust here in South Australia, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Ghana people. So my role in terms of advocacy with the National Trust is advocating for stronger protections for trees. Yep. Excellent. Well, um, as you most of you probably know today, um, we are going to be talking about all about significant trees and uh, landscapes protections. Um, it is a complex issue and legislation is different in each state and territory. So Today's going to be a bit more broad and we'll be focusing on South Australia and Victoria in particular and uh, protection issues in those two states. Um, yeah, so I guess we can maybe start off with why are trees so important? Why do they need uh, protection? Um, yeah, at the most basic level, uh, trees increase biodiversity, uh, provide habitat for native fauna. Um, they have many uses for humans as well. They give us healthy air. And there have been many studies that show what positive uh, effects they have on mental health. Um, they also provide shade and prevent urban heat islands. And uh, trees are very important for mitigating the effects of climate change. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, Joanna, but that's a very short summary. I mean, we could really go into it, but. We could, couldn't we? I, what I would say is that um, it's absolutely in our, in our interests to actually protect our trees as well as we possibly can, because when we protect them, we're really protecting ourselves as well. We get so many benefits from them. So 30% less likely to have mental health problems if you've got tree canopy around, which is significant. Um, 30% less likely to develop health that's in the poor to middle range. Um, heating and cooling costs are significantly lower if you've got trees around your home. And of course, that urban heat island effect means that if you can mitigate against that, you can actually walk to the end of the street or the train station or whatever to get the bus or train to work. So we're less reliant on um, carbon heavy transport like private cars. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, unfortunately, though, um, we have a lot of sort of pressures on our trees and landscapes currently and threats. Um, I guess we don't have too much time to go into elaborate details of some of the issues, but um, I'll give an example of uh, for Victoria, for example. So uh, we have Victoria's big build, which is um, a lot of big infrastructure projects that are happening currently all throughout Victoria and such as like new roads and things like that, which unfortunately means a lot of trees are being cut down. We also had the level crossing removals, um, urban sprawl and infill. And I imagine, Joanna, it's pretty similar in South Australia, yes? It is, yes. So uh, we are losing huge numbers of trees from private land. We're in a slightly different position from what you are. So we're also seeing those removals with DIP. That's our Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Um, but the other thing that we're seeing is um, the removals that are occurring, the vast majority of those are on private land. And you actually have significantly more public 
open space in Melbourne than what we have here in Adelaide. So everyone thinks, oh, you've got parklands, it's amazing. We've got 27%. That's all because of our development patterns. In Melbourne, you've got 40%, and in Sydney, they have 57%. So we're losing it from private land, and people are saying, oh, well, you can just plant another tree. But there's actually not enough public open space to, replant, to plant the replacement trees that we need to make up for what we're losing from the private land. So it is really problematic. And for that reason, we've been working really hard to make some global sort of changes to the legislation because we simply can't keep fighting spot fires. Yeah, and you've had some quite a few campaigns um, over the past three years. Mm. Do you want to maybe talk us through um, some of the... Yeah, some of the campaigns that you've done. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So we've been campaigning for the last three and a half years and WE is um, a coalition of partner organisations, so led by the Conservation Council of South Australia, um, involving obviously the National Trust, um, TreeNet, Trees for Life, the EDO, the Environmental Defenders Office, um, until about I think it's probably about 12 or 18 months ago, they actually had an office here in Adelaide and they were able to help us. Um, so they are a really key organisation in terms of checking through and making sure they're happy with everything from a legal point of view that we put into our reports. Um, but they no longer have the Adelaide office, so uh, they're not working with us at the moment. We've also got the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects and South Australia's Nature Conservation Foundation. So I've been campaigning for three and a half years. And as I said just before, we decided that we really needed to campaign for those global changes because spot fires left, right and centre, to keep fighting those is just so draining in terms of energy. Um, and you really need to change the big picture. So we started with an evidence-based approach and looked at what the problems were, identified those, um, and then worked to find possible solutions and worked with a whole range of industry experts to ensure that those solutions that we were putting forward were actually really practical. Um, we've had various snap actions. We've really changed the conversation in the community, which has been a really key thing in terms of bringing people on board. And um, one of the things that came out of one of those first projects that we did was a calculation that we lose net 75,000 trees a year in Adelaide on average. So that's not the number of trees that are taken down, that's the net loss. So um, if a tree is taken out and then another one's planted to replace it, that's not included in these figures. That's just the figure of those that are removed and not replaced. Yeah. So it's been, um, been a really interesting three and a half years and we're almost at the point where we're going to see some really good changes to our legislation and regulations and so on. So it's a really exciting time. Excellent. Um, and is there a place where people can read up some more on your progress or your campaigns? Definitely there is. So all of the reports that we've done to date are listed on the Conservation Council website. So um, I'll pop a link in the chat to that so that people can, um, oh, what's the chat? where's it gone? Um, so that people can actually um, follow that link. And um, there's a, a really good range of reports there. There's a myth busting document too, which is really useful. So all of those myths about how trees throw limbs at people and kill them, mm -hmm. all those sorts of myths are busted. Um, you're actually more likely to die falling out of bed than you are to <laughs> die from having a limb drop on you. So um, there's a really good amount of information available. Yeah, so this is a resource people can use um, from other parts of Australia, not just um, South yes, Australia. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, the Myth Busters is um, global yeah. in terms of its, its coverage as well. Oh, that's interesting. I've definitely got to read that, especially about um, people's uh, fears of river red gums, um, calling them widow makers and don't set up your camp underneath, which maybe you probably shouldn't, but they're probably not killing as many people as we think they are. No, and I think part of that is because we're used to having control of our environment mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, when you're out in the natural world, you don't have that same level of control as you do have when you're in the relative safety of your house. Yeah. Um, but there are lots of things that can be done to mitigate against those sorts of problems. So trees only drop limbs when they're stressed. Yeah. So if you keep the water regime fairly constant don't make sudden changes to that if they're not stressed um, in terms of 
heat and water and nutrient, then they're far less likely to drop a limb. Obviously, if you're out camping, you wouldn't set up camp under a red gum in hot weather, nor would you set up camp anywhere, you know, under its canopy when it's stormy either. So yep. you've got to be sensible. There's a certain level of risk that's inherent in anything. Um, but certainly, you know, the risks to us from, you know, alcohol, driving cars, all those sorts of things are far more likely to actually kill you than trees. Yeah. And if people have like concerns about trees on their private properties, you can always get a professional arborist. Um, they have mm. amazing technology which can sort of um, assess what the structure of the tree is like inside and whether it's structurally healthy or not. So, yeah, definitely if you're worried about risk, it's probably better to do some get some evidence if there is risk or not before cutting down a tree. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can see a question in there um, in the chat. So when we talk about the loss of trees, do we have an understanding of whether these trees are mainly established significant new growth and so on? Um, that's actually a really, really good question. So what we're seeing across Adelaide is we've got pr tree protections that have been in place since 1999. So when they were first put in place, they were actually nation leading. And then in 2011, there were some exemptions that were brought in and they have really badly undermined the protection. So a tree is protected in Adelaide if it's, it's um, well, they've divided it into two. So if it's two metres or more around at a metre off the ground, it's classed as a regulated tree. If it's three metres around in terms of its circumference, then it's classed as significant. So those trees are protected under the law. So they obviously are really old veteran kind of trees. Um, the disappointing thing about that, though, is that there are um, a species of trees that, because of their growth patterns, for instance, like a grey box that's endemic across here, never, ever, ever get to that kind of size. Like it's yep. such a rarity. So we miss out on capturing a whole lot of trees that we should be protecting. And, of course, the other downside about it is that we're not protecting the next generation of the urban forest. When we only protect the really big old ones, Yep. You can simply remove anything else without permission. So we do lose significant numbers of trees right across all of those categories, you know, just planted, relatively established, and then the really mature ones. Yeah, and just as you're talking about the size, um, like mattering in significance, um, what we find here is depending on which part of Victoria you look at, trees, um, some trees are significant and they are a large size in that area. But if you're going to compare it to the rest of the states, such as, um, I don't know, Gippsland and more wetter regions, they're going mm. to have larger trunks. So you really need to consider the context, the actual landscape where the trees uh, so yeah having that standard uh did you say four meters no it's two, two and it's two. actually um it's it's just such a huge um mark for a tree to hit so particularly across here it's really hot really dry um to actually get to two meters around is an achievement in itself um, so if you look at what they've protected the stage and we did a comparison report on this um so there are some areas where a tree is protected when it's only five centimetres around. Most states protect them with a 50 centimetre circumference. So we're kicking at two metres with exceptions in place. So Yeah, we have a comment here um, from Robin who says um, he's a recently retired urban planner in Port Phillip and a significant tree is 1.5 metres ago. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Robin, um, we also have another question. Are there issues when it comes to arguments for tree removal of non-native species that are still valuable habitat? Yeah, this is a really, really interesting question. So we have a lot of Aleppo pines across here and um, clearly they're not natives. Um, we also have the yellow-tailed black cockatoos and they've adapted and they actually use those pines now for habitat and food. There are lots of people arguing that they should be removed because they're not native trees. Um, and then there's the, the other side of the argument is, no, you can't remove them because until we get established um, the trees that they used to re-establish, the trees that they actually um, naturally feed and live in, 
uh, you're just taking away their habitat. So they're using those trees because they've adapted successfully. Um, it's our fault that their preferred trees are not there. So yeah. um, what we're really hoping to do is to see protections that look globally at all trees because yeah. in terms of climate change, we're at that point now where we really can't afford to be picky about the species or the origin of the tree. If it's an established tree and it's healthy and it's yep. not in the wrong spot, then fine, we need to keep it. Yep. Sure, if it fails and it needs to be replaced, then by all means replace it with an endemic species that will cope better with the environment and you know it provides greater habitat and so on. And um, uh, if I can just add in, um, I do understand that some exotic trees are noxious weeds, um, yes. such as here in Victoria, we have the willows. Mm -hmm. um, and it is usually, when possible, in our interest to remove them. But a lot of other trees which are introduced but not noxious weeds like that still provide very valuable habitat um, and sure. should be not. And yeah. You Sorry, go, no, no. Sorry, could I just add to that? Um, it's not just exotics that can be problematic. It, the, the right tree in the right place is the really key thing. So we have in the Mitcham Hills where I live, that's uh, the foothills area. If you have, anyone's been over to Adelaide, you know where Belair National Park is. That's the sort of area we're talking about. So there's um, black iron barks that are endemic to the area and they grow without any dramas at all. Like people wouldn't even notice them. They don't cause problems. Yeah. Way out north um, in Salisbury, they were planted, I think, 30 to 40 years ago as street trees, and they have caused so many problems. It's a totally different soil profile. And so across in Salisbury, they lift pavers, they crack and lift people's driveways. They have unfortunately you know, developed this entire generation of people out there who curse these trees because they're problematic in that area, but they pass literally unnoticed here. So it's really important to see that you do have the right tree for the right site. Um, and there is some really good research work that's being done. So TreeNet, one of our partner organisations, is um, doing some research on that for street trees. And the University of Adelaide has a future trees project. So they're looking at what will grow in the next you know, 40, 50 years successfully in our climate. Um, we have a question from Karen around the suburbs of Melbourne, long established trees are being pruned to avoid contact with electricity lines. The canopy of the tree becomes oddly V-shaped. Does this damage the tree? Yeah, this is a really vexed question. So we see this here. Some trees um, survive quite well. Others are just horrendous. They've been butchered. Um, they can become really unbalanced. So if it's a V shape and it's balanced, you would hope that it would be all right. Um, where it is more likely to be problematic, and I should um, just spoiler alert, I'm actually not a trained arborist. So, <laughs> so don't Either take this as professional advice. Um, but where it becomes unbalanced, that's where it becomes problematic. So um, if you unbalance the tree in really big winds, that's when they can fail. They can literally be blown out of the ground. And we're seeing um, there are two things here that are really problematic in terms of trees becoming unbalanced and literally blowing out of the ground. So two causes. So one is where we're removing mature existing trees in an established area. Trees have grown with other trees around them and they grow in such a way that they're buffeted by trees that are perhaps between them and the prevailing wind. And then you take away a nice big tree and you think, oh, it's only one tree, but it changes the wind and how it, how it moves and so on for those other trees in the area. So that can be really challenging. And then the other thing, of course, is climate change. There's actually a really good body of evidence now that shows that as a result of climate change, wind directions are actually changing. So that might not sound like much, but as trees grow, they buttress their roots against the prevailing wind. So if that's from the southwest, they're they're in the ground. They've planted themselves solidly in the ground to cope with the wind coming from that direction. If it changes completely and it's suddenly coming from the east, then they're not able to cope with that. So that's when they can actually blow out of the ground. So again, you know, people say trees are dangerous. Well, you know, that's our fault. We've ripped out all these trees and changed the climate. Yeah. And um, with uh, 
we do a lot of councils do inform the National Trust in Victoria here when they do pruning works on significant trees and um, they get professional arborists um, mm. who know what they are doing to yes. try and do it in the most, um, I guess, sympathetic way possible to yes. the tree. And that's a really good thing. We've had some changes that came in, I think it was two years ago here, some regulatory changes, and basically it's a cost-shifting exercise. So SAPEN is our power network authority, and um, they have previously been the people who've had responsibility for pruning street trees, and there's been some dreadful butchering that's gone on in terms of keeping them away from the power lines, this is. Um, and so what's happened is that they are now saying that any tree that is planted by council, that at maturity is going to be more than five metres high, um, they won't take responsibility for pruning that. So they're actually literally going through auditing all of the council areas and letting them know which their trees are that are non-compliant. So the councils are then going to be in the horrible position of having to decide whether they go down the track of retaining those trees and taking on the costs of the pruning and so on themselves, or do they actually take them out and plant something which is going to grow under the power lines and not through and around them? So that's a significant loss of canopy for a lot of streets. So very problematic. Yeah. Um, okay, do I see? Uh... No, nope, uh, no new questions. Um, yeah, um, so I guess maybe we can talk a bit about uh, how people can go about protecting trees on their properties. So um, from, I guess, any unwanted development or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I know in Victoria, we do have some legislation, um, especially for indigenous or native uh, flora and fauna of course we have the commonwealth environment protection and biodiversity conservation act 1999 um, which is uh, also has a nationally uh, threatened species and ecological community list so i guess threatened species could possibly have the most protection um we also have uh uh, laws in place for uh, Aboriginal um, heritage and cultural places. Um, so any place, or this includes trees which are import cu cultural um, mm. trees, also protected. They're not allowed to be damaged um, without consent from or permission from the appropriate Aboriginal council or organisation. Although, as we know, sometimes these uh, people do things without alerting in illegal ways, like taking down trees and things like that. But um, the laws are there. Um, we also have the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act 1988, um, which also has a threatened species list in Victoria. So these species are prioritized and also not to be removed. Um, yep, yeah, and I could mention a whole lot of other acts um, and things like that, but maybe for Victoria, the most important would be the Planning and Environment Act uh, 1987, which um, provides the Victorian planning provisions. And we have zones and overlays, which can be used to protect trees. So, um, yes. yeah, that's yeah. probably our biggest way. And I'll maybe get to that a bit later. But did you want to maybe talk about some of the laws? Um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in and make some comment yeah. about that. So we've just got, um, we've got our, our tree regulations in place as part of the planning and design code, and um, there are exemptions. So if a, a, tree, a significant or regulated tree is protected, unless development that is reasonable or expected could otherwise not go ahead. Um, if you've got a tree, a protected tree on your block and it's within 10 metres of your home or a swimming pool, you can remove that without council permission, unless it's an, a eucalyptus or an Agonis fletchuosa, which is a willow myrtle and a tree from WA. No one can shed any light on how this Western Australian tree got, got this exemption status. But what that unfortunately means is that someone can have a massive river red gum. It can be within 10 metres of their pool. 
it's not protected at all. So they just have to get council permission to take it out. You could have a huge oak that's well established, really healthy within 10 metres of your home and bang, you can just take that out, not even needing to get council permission for that one. So that's an exemption that we're really keen um, to see removed. Um, the other thing um, that I was going to mention was your overlays. Yes. When we did our comparison report with what our tree laws are like here and what they're like interstate, we were really keen, because we knew that our tree laws were bad, we were really keen to see just how bad they were by comparison. Um, so it had something really concrete to actually push back against and say, come on, we need to do better. This is what other people are doing. So your vegetation overlays are actually really impressive. So we're really, yeah, they're really good. And the detail that they go into is just mind boggling. It's incredible. Um, so we're really keen to see councils given the capacity to actually and encouraged to put those in as well. The other thing we're really keen to see over here is for the government to lead by example. So our infrastructure department, the transport people and our education department have exemptions. So they can remove any protected tree without permission. So if it's on school grounds, the corner of an oval or something, no one goes anywhere near it, they can still say, no, we're taking it down. Um, and we had a couple of incidences where there's um, a roadworks project that was going on and it was to make an area safer. So a big, a big um, roundabout going in at an intersection, but not adding any more lanes. And there were almost 200 uh, river red gums mostly that were removed in order to carry this out. In the end, there were trees that were taken out because they were eight, nine, 10 metres away from the road. And they actually took them out preemptively because they thought they might impact their root zone when they excavated for the road. And unfortunately, local people had asked about the numbers of trees that might go and they were told it's only a few. It was almost 200. And some of them were almost nine metres around. So we're talking really big remnant trees. That's so really that heartbreaking. Was, it was absolutely heartbreaking. People in tears left, right and centre. And it was bad enough when the trees were coming out, but it was even worse afterwards. So this was an area... Um, uh, to the northeast of Adelaide in the foothills, lots of koalas and so on, obviously, in this area. So for the local people who lived there, the loss of the trees was awful. But the carnage that they saw on the roads afterwards as koalas were trying to cross back and forth to find somewhere to live once their tree had gone was horrendous. It went on for months. So we really need to see our government doing better and leading by example. Yeah. Um, I can see a question here from Justin, which I'm really happy to ask answer. So um, I have absolutely no problem with that, Justin. But what I do have a problem with is the removal of a significant tree in order to replace it with a species that has better climate resilience. So we're at the point where change the climate is such that it's becoming more difficult to establish new trees. Um, and a lot of the time we're dependent on those established trees to provide canopy to help those younger trees um, grow. There's also a lot of evidence that shows that trees will divert nutrient from their roots to the roots of trees around them that are struggling. So that's a really good reason for having existing trees around. They don't even need to be of the same species for them to do that. It's just amazing. Um, so yes, better climate resilience, absolutely. As long as, as it is the right tree in the right place and it's not at the cost of um, an existing tree. We yep. really need the canopy. And I'll just uh, read out the question so everyone um, who might not be able to see it um, knows what we're talking about. Uh, Justin asks, what are your thoughts on the replacement of significant trees with species that may have better climate resilience? Um, and I would say my answer will be the exact same as yours, Joanna. Um, definitely uh, a, removing a healthy significant tree definitely against that. Um, even if you plant it with something more resilient afterwards, it's going to take years for that tree to get established and provide the same sort of effects that an already established tree has. That's, um, that's why it's, um, I'm, I might get a bit sidetracked here, but uh, I was a bit horrified. We recently um, sort of uh, 
a planning application for um, the new Melbourne airport rail where they wanted to, uh, they applied to be able to um, cut down 27 trees um, in a garden, um, already established trees. And, you know, it, in the planning application, it was sort of no fuss or we'll just plant more mm. trees, you know, but it's like, that's, that not all of those trees, you know, are going to successfully grow. It's going to take years to have the effect. Um, mm. So, yeah, we strongly suggest that, that they consider um, other alternative options which will retain those trees rather than removing trees and then planting them again. Mm. Yep. And, uh, yeah, it's not just years to get them established and, and get the benefits from them. It's actually decades. So it's 30 yeah. years minimum yeah. before you, you see any kind of biodiversity services. The other thing that people might be interested in in terms of advocacy, um, particularly in, in where you're talking about tree removals from roadworks, we had a road project just, just down the road from May and I um, had some contact with um, people at the Wait Arboretum. I don't know if, if people are familiar with the Wait Arboretum, but it's a national living, it's a living museum. And it's basically a whole lot of trees that were planted from about 1928. I think it's the first one on. They just rely on rainfall. It's, it's incredible. It's a really great resource. And I got in touch with um, the woman who runs the Arboretum and asked her, because we had some big river red guns that were at risk of being taken down for a road project. So under our um, regulation significant tree laws, if you take out a regulated tree, you need to plant two trees to replace it. But that, there's no, no specification about size. So it could be little tube stop, um, $3 tube stop from Bunnings, and that's your obligation fulfilled. If it's a significant tree, and then it's three to replace it. And what we wanted to know was how many trees would you need to plant, because this was near a road, if you were to see no um, lessening of air quality. So looking at the, the, those services that trees provide in terms of cleaning the air and keeping all those micro particles from out of our lungs. Um, so bearing in mind it's three that we would have had to plant for these. So what I wanted to know was metre high saplings, how many of those? And she worked out to replace a 150 year old gum that's in good health, you would actually need to plant 891 metre high saplings if there were to be not, you'd get like for like air quality. So no drop in air quality. Now we know already that we don't have the room to plant the two or three just where we're going to plant the 891. And then obviously you'd need to selectively remove them and so on to, to allow the one to grow yeah. um, to maturity. But it's just not doable. Yeah. Just not doable. And I guess um, sort of leading into that, that just kind of reminds me of offsetting, mm. uh, vegetation removal, um, offsetting, and even um, sort of uh, carbon offsetting and things like that. Like um, it's kind of why it doesn't really work the way it seems to on paper mm. but that's um yeah. yeah I'm so glad you've shared that figure with us that it would take 800 meter height yeah, 891 so, yeah yeah and offsetting is just lazy isn't it it's it should yeah. be your last possible yeah. alternative you should try everything else first definitely um we just had a comment um from Melissa saying um H.B. McKay Gardens is a significant historical garden in an area where there are not many trees. So, um, yeah, that was the 27 trees that I mentioned. Oh, that, that's um, they were right. Into. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with the gardens, so yeah. I, I can't comment. It's always really disappointing, isn't it? You know, tree loss full stop when we need them so badly, but particularly when it's in an area where there is not a huge amount of canopy. Yep. To actually go and take trees out from there is just so wrong. That's yep. where you need to keep it. Yep, definitely. Mm. Um, uh, so maybe going back to a bit overlays and um, planning scheme zones um, have a bit of a sort of um, hot topic, what's happening in Victoria, which I'm sure many people have heard of. Um, but basically, uh, so we planning scheme zones um, they uh, they specify what sort of uh, purpose they want to use the land for, mm. like whether it's um, general residential zone or yeah. public park zone or farming zone. Um, 
And one of the things we've had some problems with lately is uh, rezoning that's happened years ago that nobody really knew about. Um, and suddenly, you know, there's a planning application for a new estate or things like that. So two cases we have here uh, is Bright. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about the Elm Avenues that are on the way on the entrance to Bright. And um, we also have a very similar case in Dalesford. Um, where a uh, plot has been rezoned um, and there are there is an avenue of cedar trees and some of them need to be removed to make entrances into the new estates. So these um, both cases, I believe the zones were farming zones and have been um, changed to uh, general residential zones and neighbourhood residential zone. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Unfortunately for us, in this case, none of those tree have, the trees have protective overlays. So we're in a bit of a pickle in how we can protect those trees because it's been rezoned for develop for yeah, for mm. estate development. It's really disappointing, isn't it? And that's one of the challenges that we're seeing across here as well. So under our new planning code, if you want to put in a, a zone amendment, a code amendment to rezone something it costs you $50,000. So developers can do that really easily. Yeah, that's um, nothing to them. It's absolutely nothing. It's very, very difficult for members of the public to fight. Yeah. And our new planning code is new. So um, we're in that horrible situation where if members of the public, you know, community groups and communities don't start to get some runs on the board, then all of the precedent that is... Um, that is around is going to be in favour of developers. Yeah. So it's a very, very tricky situation. Um, we've had we've had a couple of wins with trees, but we've really had to push, 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 you know, very gently, very respectfully, um, and get the community on board and really make it clear that, and one of the things that we found has resonated with um, members of parliament has been that, whatever part of the law it is that's wrong or these, this particular tree removal or whatever does not meet community expectations. Yeah. That's really resonated um, with people. So that's been, that's been useful language to use. I don't know if that's any use to you in your bright situation. Yeah, I think you have to make it really unpalatable oh, can to you make tell that us, decision. Yeah, can you tell us about some of your wins? Like we definitely want to hear some positive mm. stories as well. Happy to, yeah. So it's not all bad news. Um, so we have had some really good wins and along the way we've actually built really fantastic communities. So um, I'll highlight, have we got time for me to give you a couple of wins and then talk about some of the community building that we've done? Yeah, is that yeah. time for that? Okay. I think so. All right. <laughs> so one of my favourite wins was um, Housing Choices Australia. So social housing, a series of about oh, 10 or 12 um, townhouses all in a row in Hackney, which is an in a, in a well, city fringe suburb and there's a car park at the back big lemon scented gum not much else really in the car park in terms of vegetation but this big beautiful tree and they decided that they're going to take it out they said no it's dangerous it's coming out so I got a phone call one afternoon and the and it was coming out the next morning so we sort of gathered rent a crowd and got half a dozen of us down there um, we were really fortunate someone had gone to work that day and left their car parked under the canopy of the tree um, so unfortunately, the guy couldn't be got in contact with and it couldn't be moved. So it was put off until the next day. Um, but meanwhile, it gave us a little bit of time to actually get in touch with Housing Choices Australia. And um, uh, the conversation was along the lines of, have you had an independent arborist had a look at, had a look at this? And they say, yes, we have. And we said, look, we can see that it's doing some lion tailing, which is when it sends out these really long sort of extended branches and they can be dangerous. Um, not an arborist, but we're pretty sure it can be pruned for safety. So please could you get an independent arborist to have a look at it? So they were a bit grumpy that they did um, because we'd managed to get some media coverage by then. And in the end, what happened was the independent arborist came back and said, it doesn't need to be removed. It can actually be pruned for safety. So this was really important. Um, it was a real moral victory because we're talking about social housing 
and um, not fantastic areas of garden in the complex. But the local residents used to actually take their tree, their chairs out and sit in the shade of the tree and have a cup of tea and a drink and whatever. And it was it was the central part of their community. It was their common ground. So if they lost the tree, they were going to lose a whole lot more than you know, just a tree. Um, so we won that. But the really exciting thing about it was that only a few weeks ago, I met someone who works with Housing, Housing Choices Australia, and they said to me, out of that, they've actually now had a change of policy. So if there are any concerns raised about trees, they actually now go out and get uh, independent um, opinions from two independent arborists before they make a decision. So that was a fantastic victory. That was really heartwarming. Um, another one we had, Renewal SA, which is basically the government department that deals with disposal of land and so on. So the old Royal Adelaide Hospital site was, is being rebuilt, uh, redeveloped. And they wanted to take two century old London plane trees out of an avenue in Throne Road. And some people don't like London plane trees, totally understood. But this it's amazing. You walk under there on a hot day in Adelaide and it's like 10 degrees cooler. You can just feel it. It's, in, it's just incredible. And the shade and the canopy are beautiful. And they said, oh, no, we need to get trucks safely in and out and there's no way we can do it. Well, we managed to have a protest. We got some radio coverage. Kev, the truck, we phoned in and said, I've been taking trucks on and off that site for the last seven years and there's never been a single new miss. And we actually pushed back and said, what other options have you looked at? And when, when that question was asked of them, they actually said, oh, we haven't. We've just gone. That's a, that was their go-to position was we'll just take the trees out. So when push came to shove, they were actually able to come up with an alternative that gave them safe access to and from the site and yep. didn't, didn't require any trees to be taken out. Yep. So it can definitely be done. Um, yeah. The other thing that we've done a lot of, we've had a review into our planning and design code, and we've also just had a review, um, in, an inquiry into our urban forest that was run by the Environment Resources and Development Committee of State Parliament. And we've had huge numbers of submissions going from people about that, really focusing on trees, obviously for the urban forest one, um, but the planning and design code covered a lot more as well. They had more submissions on trees than anything else. And part of that was because um, over the last three and a half years, we've, we've got together a list of people who are um, concerned about tree loss, have come along to events, feeling really despondent, feeling they're the only person who's worried about trees and gone home absolutely thrilled to know that, you know, they're not on their own. Other people actually feel the same way and are actually actively doing things. And with regard to those opportunities to put in submissions, we actually ran workshops and gave people a template, said to them, come along, bring examples of tree loss in your local area and sat down, talked it all through, put their um, email together and by the end of the session they'd sent it off. But it was also a really lovely community building exercise. So, um, you know, when people turned up to the face-to-face -face ones in particular, because you can't do the same thing on Zoom, but with the face-to-face -face ones, everyone who turned up left the room talking with a new friend that they'd made and they always seemed to find something in common. So they maybe lived close together and had a particular concern about, you know, frogs in the local area or biodiversity and so on. And they're all going to go and work on projects together. It's been a really lovely thing to do. Yeah. So that's a massive win, not just for the trees, but for community as well. Oh, those are wonderful, wonderful stories. Thank you for the optimism. <laughs> there's a lot, got, there's a lot of really positive things that are happening, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not all gloom and doom. Um, so I'm trying to see, we may have had a few questions pop up. Um, so can you explain the difference and power of the various tree and landscape overlays? How can we use them to advocate for our trees and environment? Um, we are running a little bit of <laughs> out of time slowly. Um, I might just quickly go over um, some of the overlays that uh, are most relevant to protecting trees and landscapes. Um, so, um, 
sorry, everyone, just looking over my notes. Uh, so we have the vegetation protection overlays, um, significant landscape overlays, environmental significance overlays, and heritage overlays. We also have some other uh, overlays such as erosion control overlay, salinity management overlays, neighborhood character overlays. So there's various overlays and it's really up to your local council um, and the regulations in these overlays will vary from council to council. So what I would suggest is looking up um, on the Vic plan uh, website, you can look up your area, certain properties, it will tell you what zone it's in, um, what overlays, protective overlays, if it has any are, and what sort of uh, if there are tree controls um, and other sort of protections and what you need to apply for a permit and things like that. Um, uh, are there, sorry, another question from uh, Melissa. Are there concerns about the Vic government plan to remove council from the uh, approval process for new development? I understand we need a uh, suburban infill, but when we know the impact of heat islands, especially in the Western suburbs where I live, the loss of established trees can have huge impacts. I'm uh, happy to jump in there if you yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Sure, no worries. Um, I obviously can't speak from Victorian context, but we've just seen the same thing happen here, Melissa. So under our new planning code, um, you no longer need to go to council to get approval. Um, council has very little say in what goes on and we have a statewide planning system. So where we used to have things that reflected um, the, the desires and you know, the outcomes and so on that, that the local community wanted to see, we don't have that anymore. It's basically one size fits all and the removal of councils um, from the decision-making process is really undemocratic. So I would say fight it for all it's worth. Um, across here, we had consultation on the proposed new planning and development, uh, planning and design code. And that consultation was horrendous. It didn't really fit in terms of the community engagement charters. So if you don't feel you've been listened to, it's tokenistic. It's not genuine consultation. That's clearly stated. And that was certainly what was going on here. So there was a significant um, petition, hard copy petition that was got together. I'm not sure what the situation is in Victoria, but here in South Australia, once you get 10,000 signatures on a paper petition, it gets it goes to the Legislative Review Committee of Parliament and they have to report back to that relevant minister who then has to report back publicly on it. Um, at this point, we can't, our Parliament won't accept e petitions. So we ended up with 14,000 signatures on that petition, which was really significant. And that was what forced the review into our planning and design code. So the expert review panel was actually quite engaged. We were pleasantly surprised, asked lots of really good questions, and we're waiting for their report to go to the minister. Um, but certainly, as you say, you know, our western suburbs here had that exact same situation. There are some suburbs in the west of Adelaide where they have less than 10% canopy, which is horrendous. Um, and they've had an 80% increase in the density. Um, so it's just through subdivision in the last decade alone. So you're absolutely right. The loss of established trees does have a significant impact. And I think it's really important to put the tree ahead of everything else. So designing around existing trees, um, rewarding people who develop for retaining them. And what we see here is that those so-called mum and dad developments where, you know, a couple buys a block, subdivides it, and it's part of their super fund and all that kind of stuff, and it's, you know, very tax deductible kind of things, um, they're the worst. The bigger developers tend to actually retain, on, on bigger sites, tend to retain more trees, and there are bigger expectations about the minimum amounts of open space and canopy that they have to provide. So it is, I would fight tooth and nail against that. I'm not sure how winnable it is, but you have to be really clear that it's not acceptable, I think. Yeah. And I know we've um, mostly been speaking about trees today, but um, also um, in the western suburbs of um, Melbourne, um, what we have a 
significant grasslands and I feel like trees have get mm. a lot of the attention and sort of uh other plants other plant yeah. forms like grasslands yeah. sort of um just get annihilated and it's almost like nobody even notices so yeah this is highly concerning indeed um it's a like that in South Australia as well it is and look there's really good evidence that shows that okay so totally established everyone here knows that you know green canopy and trees and so on are really good for our health but there's also a really good amount of evidence now that shows that the higher the quality of your open green space so the fact that it is green that it is really varied it's not just you know monothematic in terms of the species um, the higher the quality the greater the positive impacts on people and of course, there's all that evidence about the greater the biodiversity, the, the greater you know, the biome, um, the stretch of biomes and gut health and all those sorts of things that are really significant, that yeah. they haven't quite worked out how they work yet, but they know that they actually do work. Um, so yes, it's not just about trees. Trees have sort of become the poster child, haven't they? Because yeah. they're, the, they're the ones that provide the canopy that cools the streets and the homes and so on. But they are just one part of a really complex web. So, yeah, no, you're right. You need to look after everything. Yeah, and that's, again, when those sort of overlays, like environmental mm. significance overlays could come in, things like that. Um, so we have about uh, four minutes left. Uh, Joanna, is there anything in particular? Yeah. You, I know you have a lot going on in South Australia. So um, yeah, is there maybe like a take home message or something you want to share with everyone before we finish up? Oh, well, I'll just keep it really brief. I would say in summary, um, I guess oh, five things, maybe let's go for five things. So don't <laughs> despair. You're not the only person who's concerned about tree loss. Um, make sure that you talk with people about it because the quiet conversations that you have are the things that are going to bring other people on board. So people act, people actually respond and do something when they've had a conversation with someone they trust. So talk with your friends, talk with your family, use the media. You know, talk back radio and letters to the editor can be really, really powerful. Um, they don't have to be long. You don't have to be professional. They just have to come from the heart. Um, and if there's something going on locally, get involved. And if no one's leading the charge, be the person who does. It's actually not that hard. And we've got so much to lose from not doing it, but so much to gain when we actually do act. So the flip side of, you know, all the grief that people feel about the loss of trees, that's because, you know, love, grief is the price that you pay for love. The flip side of that love, not the grief, is the fact that it can be the thing that prompts you to act. So make sure you use your lovely trees to get some good results. It's absolutely lovely. And um, I guess I would also say uh, be proactive rather than reactive where you can. So if there is a tree you love, maybe check out with your local council if they have a local tree register nominate that tree for registration um, and try to get it protected with your local council before something happens to it. Again, it's much easier to be proactive than reactive. Yeah, definitely. And relationships with your local councillors, your local ward council, uh, their ward councillors here, I'm not sure what they are over in Victoria, they're a really great thing. So find out who the greenies are, find out who the people are who support trees and, and try and develop a relationship with them. Yeah, Definitely and most different. most councils do have really good environmental teams and they do care um, and they will try to help where they can. <laughs> they are listening. Sometimes you just have to Definitely. be persistent. You do. Persistence okay. pays off. Okie dokie. Well, um, if I think that's about it. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We hope you learned something or got something from the discussions um, and please uh, join us for the next two uh, webinars in the series um, uh, the next Friday and the Friday after um, and yes uh, thank you Joanna as well so much for 
taking the time and you've been very uh inspirational I say oh. to me so I hope to everyone else as well thank you it's been an absolute pleasure and um I know I'm not over Victoria but if anyone is ever stuck and um needs a bit of a shot in the arm to fight for a tree I'm more than happy for you to get in touch thank you so much all right well thank you everyone um and we'll see you next time <laughs>